Good morning, everyone. Uh, please allow me to thank the uh, program chairs and conference chairs and the organizers of this meeting for the opportunity, the invitation to be here uh, with you uh, this, this morning. And uh, I am looking forward to this conference, um, though I have minor concerns as to how the rest of it's going to unfold given the, the last five minutes. By the way, the word is pronounced paradigm, not paradigm. I'm here to represent a challenging topic, but one that will in one way or another impact all of us, uh, especially the younger members of our audience over the next two decades. It is the continuing or the appearance of continuing advance in the field, the broad field of supercomputing or high performance computing. But the challenges that we're facing, which are really beyond those that we've encountered at least over the last two dozen years, and ways that we may address those challenges. What I'd like you to take away from this is that the next 20 years is not going to be anything like the last 20 years. How we prepare to develop such systems, and more importantly, how we prepare to use such systems uh, for uh, the future challenges in, in the broadest sense in computing uh, will uh, in part be determined uh, I think by the issues that I have the opportunity to share with you uh, over the next uh, uh, half hour or so. I have followed and worked with uh, members of the high performance computing community internationally in of course the US but also Europe, in Japan, in China and uh, in parts of Asia. And the depth of consideration the planning for new directions and the uh, dialogue and indeed tension over what those new directions may comprise uh, is um, very active and I will be able to touch only on uh, some of those but I hope uh, by the time I'm done that you will realize this is, this is a very exciting era uh, for all of us. Now I of course think I know what the answer is. And in case I miss telling you, the question is, how do we get beyond uh, the computing arena that we are today? Most of you would probably say, well, this is not a real problem. I mean, look at the history. I'm about to look at the history with you. And uh, perhaps when I'm done, uh, you'll uh, pause and consider that perhaps the, his the future is not anything like the history. There are two likely paths that will be pursued over the next seven years or so. One, uh, an evolutionary path, a path that continues as it did over the last 25 years to extend the techniques incrementally uh, over past, in the past quite successful, but uh, uh, methods which are now beginning to uh, struggle in providing a continued direction. And the alternate path is uh, a revolutionary path a path that uh, breaks with tradition, breaks with common practices, and uh, presents new opportunities to address the challenges in order to move forward. This is a highly contentious debate currently, and I assure you that just about everything I'm going to say will be considered controversial. And very good people, people some of whom I consider my friends around the world, would give you a different story. I will try through intellectual integrity to at least alert you to where they're wrong. But uh, nonetheless, I, uh, I uh, am going to give a biased view. But you know, that's kind of the cool thing of giving a keynote talk. The only thing cooler than giving a keynote talk, by the way, is giving a banquet talk. In the keynote talk, you still have to stay within the bounds of truth. In the keynote talk, you can, and in banquet talk, you can talk Real, you can say whatever you want. I almost use a vernacular term to describe it, but uh, uh, too polite. <clears throat> what I'm going to focus on is how we break from the past and principally on a, a new paradigm, uh, a new approach to execution models, a term you may not hear frequently, but in fact you have lived through multiple execution models uh, throughout your careers. And we're going to talk about how, through practical means, we're able to consider the possibility of doing something that's much more difficult than you might anticipate, and that is achieving practical and effective exascale uh, computing. 
couple of slides on history. So, high performance computing and I have a lot in common. For the, all intents and purposes, high performance computing started in 1949, and so did I. In one human lifetime, computing has advanced in terms of its measured capability by about a factor, and I'm being conservative, a factor of 10 trillion. There is no technology in human history that came anywhere near in terms of numbers of orders of magnitude, this kind of expanse or growth, let alone in the period of one human lifetime. I challenge you, uh, and, and you will find some interesting technologies, but I challenge you uh, the, uh, to find one that comes even with logarithmically half of what this is. In the 30s and, and before, some of the fundamental principles were laid down by such people as Norbert Wiener and Alan Turing and John von Neumann and, um, uh, and others uh, to establish the idea of computability and laid down a basis of means that would permit uh, formal methods and approaches to the development of machines. And very quickly, unfortunately, somewhat spurred by uh, the, the by, there's no way to put it otherwise, right? But spurred by the necessity of war, within one decade, computing went from a, a somewhat uh, uh, archaic approach of electromechanical devices to uh, the supercomputing of uh, stored, stored program digital electronics. And yet, since then, Although there's been much innovation in development of machines that we use, and we've experienced that 10 trillion factor in performance gain, nonetheless, all the machines that we use today for science and commerce, for real world computing, are derivatives of that early work. And when I say derivatives, I don't simply mean, well, the history is back there. I mean that the concepts are very much still the same, modified, but still the same. Here is a slide that in, in, uh, moves up to the petaflops era of about 2008 to 2010. And the different colors represent the driving factors of new device technologies. The pictures, the diagrams you see, show the different classes of machines. What's really going on here is that there are actually different paradigms. We have, by my count, experienced at least five, perhaps six paradigms in the period of one human lifetime to deliver continuously a growth of something on the order of uh, 11, uh, I'm sorry, in, the, in a period of 11 years, a growth of about uh, 10,000. I'm sorry, 1,000, 1,000 every 11 years. That's roughly the curve. However, I'm going to show you that that is now changing and not for the best. This is where you are today. Interestingly, if I were giving this talk last year, I would show this same slide. Because at the very highest end of supercomputing, at least as measured by the uh, LINPAC, or more precisely, the HPL benchmark, the number one machine and the number two machine have not changed. In fact, in the last five half-year episodes, and, and this is measured every, every half year or so, the number one machine has not changed. It is uh, Tianhua II in Tianjin, China, uh, at the uh, National University uh, uh, Defense Technology. National University of Defense Technology, excuse me. I have been there, a uh, remarkable city, largely made out of Lego blocks. I'm convinced it's the only way they could have built it in five years. It's, it's really quite extraordinary. I did not, I have not seen Tianhua 2, but I did see its predecessor, Tianhua 1A. This machine is the fastest machine. It's about 32 petaflops, uh, again, Linpack, which if you are of like mind with me, you measure logarithmically, which suggests that we are halfway between one petaflops and one exaflops. 32 is 2 to the 5th, and to get to an exaflops, you need 2 to the 10th petaflops, hence 2 to the 5th is halfway. Uh, Titan is the fastest machine in the U.S. It's number 2, and it has been uh, on the list at, near, at or near the top for seven of these episodes. It's about 18 petaflops. Ken Ha consumes about 24 megawatts of power. 
Now, a somewhat subjective, arbitrary uh, notion of threshold of pain is around 20 megawatts. If you ask them and say, how much power do they consume, they'll tell you something like uh, 17 megawatts, but they're not including cooling. That brings it up to 24. And Titan uh, is about eight, about 8 megawatts, and this is at uh, Oak Ridge National Lab in, in Tennessee in the US. The reason I also show these two pictures is because they represent two different, perhaps significantly different approaches to achieving the same kind of sustained performance. We'll come back to this, but the Tianha 2 is using fine grain processors developed by Intel. Uh, many of you may be familiar with it, the Xeon Phi, uh, also known earlier as Mike. And the Titan uh, is using uh, GPUs, uh, the NVIDIA GPUs, which are considered to be a very popular way also to approach power. We'll come back to that in a moment, too. I expect by the time I'm done, your views will have changed. Now, well, I've given you a, a flash uh, view of 70 years of supercomputing. We need now to drop a little bit into the uh, subtleties. This is a graph provided by my colleague, Peter Kogi at the University of Notre Dame, a Seymour Cray Award winner. Uh, Peter uh, has been tracking the relationship between clock rates, power, uh, and performance now uh, s since uh, an early uh, project funded by uh, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. I had the, had the honor of being part of that study. Uh, but Peter has continued to update these. And what you're seeing here, and if you look carefully, this is the um, uh, measure of concurrency measured by the number of uh, cores uh, that, um, that we're having. And you will see that there are two exponential lines here. One roughly to the left of 2004, which is where we have existed now for decades. And this is an exponential growth of about 70% in performance gain uh, uh, over, over that period. And now here in concurrency, you see a break point, a point of inflection, where the amount of concurrency, again, is measured at the hardware level, has suddenly taken what is, in fact, a steep rise. And this has now existed over the last 10 years. It is a major change in technology. It is offering us some real opportunities towards achieving exascale, but it is challenging us to get there. This, um, this uh, chart uh, is only a couple of weeks old. Uh, Eric Strohmeyer of uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory uh, provided it to me. It is an ongoing work in progress, continuing plotting of uh, key points in the advance of supercomputing. And now this is over 20 years uh, in, um, uh, spanning over 20 years in half year periods. The red line you see is the LINPAC performance uh, by the, fast, the fastest machine uh, in the world, at least as measured. And if you'll observe, it is roughly speaking exponentially, although it's a sawtooth wave, the uh, dotted red line indicates the, uh, uh, the exponential growth of that period. The bottom line is the 500th fastest machines. People tend, their eyes tend to be drawn to the red line, but it is in fact the number 500 machine that is by far the most interesting. The blue line is the sum of all the machines, number one through number 500, in terms of the performance that you see. Now, in, in uh, the cases of the blue and the yellow line, you have two dotted lines of each of the two colors. The uh, steeper one is the one that is extrapolated from uh, the beginning, 1993, of collecting this very useful data. The second line with the more shallow slope is more recent and fits a curve uh, over the last um, uh, two or three years. And what you see dramatically, and this is not simply a blip on a curve, is that the slope of this line, which had been relatively continuous for over 20 years is now changing dramatically. And yet, it is that red line, here I don't have a separate curve for it because, again, it's a sawtooth curve, but it is that red line that predicted, notice I use the past tense, that 
we would achieve, we, the community of humanity in supercomputing, would achieve exaplops, at least as measured by LINPAC, by the year 1919. No, let's try that again. I'm only off by 100 years. <laughs> by the year, I wasn't there either. By the year 2019. Wonder how many more of those I'm going to do. By the year 2019, it is no longer believed unless some nation hungry for perceived stature decides to throw enough money at a useless stunt machine. And we have had stunt machines in the past, but it is no longer believed that uh, we will uh, achieve useful, underline useful exascale by, before the end of this decade. Now, I hate to break the hearts of a number of you who are wedded to the admittedly exciting technology of GPUs. Indeed, for certain applications and in certain system classes, a GPU is just really cool. And if you don't mind programming at two or three levels of code, uh, using uh, GPUs to accelerate can give you as much as an order of magnitude or more performance gain in special cases. That's, that's thrilling. Uh, in the uh, inter introduction of me you didn't get, uh, you will uh, find that some 20 years ago I had an opportunity to work in the pioneering area of commodity clusters. And it was that kind of excitement, the opportunity to do things that were not being done this way before, that GPUs also offer. However, here also taken from Eric, is a curve of the uh, performance share that accelerators are providing against all 500 machines. And if you look to your right, you see a plateau. It's not even a true plateau, is it? Because on average, it's a negative slope. That is not the curve of a growth community. That is not a curve of some rapidly accelerating approach. That, in fact, is a curve of stagnation. And that's the good news. The bad news is that included in those curves are the Intel Xeon fees, which, because, unfortunately, they had to be put at the wrong end of a PCI bus and in their own container, not as part of the same address space, uh, was considered, well, it's an accelerator since it's not part of the real computer. Well, that's going to change to Intel's credit. Uh, shortly, and I'll have one slide on this, shortly we're going to see that uh, we're going to be moving away from Intel fees being merely pursued as attached processors, attached accelerators, and that they will be central, engaged, integrated, fully synthesized with the memory system. And therefore, uh, uh, what's the phrase that I've seen recently come up? Um, uh, host, hosting computers, as if some other computer we're hosting. I, I don't understand that. So that curve is actually going to be much worse when we extract the new fee-based machines from the accelerated column and move them, migrate them, into the mainstream. So if you think that GPUs are going to save you, your community does not, apparently. At least uh, that's it. But there are exciting things that are happening. Just a few weeks ago, IBM announced a 7 nanometer chip, admittedly prototype, uh, with uh, something like uh, uh, 20 billion transistors on it. And this does show at least that we are getting down towards nanoscale technology. But we won't get further. There are these things called atoms. There's this nasty little characteristic of reality called the speed of light. And if you took freshman physics, you know about Boltzmann's constant. If we stay with the same device technology, the semiconductor technology, and that doesn't necessarily mean silicon. That can be a mix of silicon and germanium, which I believe was used here. Uh, we nonetheless have limitations in terms of how we can continue to accelerate using the technology trends. In fact, for some, that already ended. Now, to understand the rest of my presentation, I have to give you like a one-slide tutorial on performance factors, sources of performance degradation. So bear with me and my pedagogical uh, style here. But it's important because if you go back to that history, that seven-decade history, and ask 
how did the architectures of those systems change? How did the programming models vary? You'll find that in every case, they addressed overtly and explicitly, or intuitively and uh, implicitly, four principal characteristics that degrade, uh, uh, degrade the performance of computing. And those, and I, I will use my terms, they have, they're widely used terms, but they have different meanings to different people. Those are starvation, or the inadequacy or lack of work to be performed. And that lack of work, by the way, can be there just isn't enough work to keep the system busy, or yes, there's enough work, but we haven't distributed it right. So some parts of the machine have too much work, and some have too little. But some parts of the systems, at least, are starving. Latency, this is the access time to some remote resource or service, or just, just data. And the, the, the innate time it takes to get there and to get back. And by the way, that can vary by five orders of magnitude, just to pick a number. Some of you will say, no, but what about, you know, tapes? Okay, eight orders of magnitude. Um, or somebody else will speed up uh, using graphene, uh, what, a register to register op, and I'll have to add another order of magnitude. Overhead. Overhead is insidious. This is the, the extra work that you do to manage the parallelism of the physical system and the parallelism of the abstract computation. And it's work that if you had done this on a sequential computer, not that you can find a sequential computer, but if you had done this on a sequential computer, you would not have, um, uh, uh, you would not have had to perform it. You say, okay, that's wasted work. That may be wasted energy. All this is true. But we can live with that. Eh. Problem with overhead is that this relation I've shown you is not orthogonal. These parameters are not independent. And overhead, in fact, defines an upper bound on the effective granularity of the parallelism that you can exploit, at least for fixed size work. And then that, in turn, determines the maximum performance you can achieve independent of the amount of hardware you throw at it. This is fundamental. This is profound. And as I say, and that's the good news, the bad news is then you have contention for shared resources. Okay, so as we think about um, how we need to advance computing, we have to think about these four parameters and how they're addressed by past and future methods of developing them. Now, now what I really would have liked to have done is given you the equivalent of Maxwell's equations for performance. And it isn't that I haven't tried to generate that. But Maxwell was a Scottish genius, and he had a lot of people working behind him, like Faraday and Coulomb and Orsted, and, and I know I'm missing a few, Ohm and Volta. And um, I, we don't have that equation. But there are other ways to do it, thanks to computing. And so here is a, a, an example of a representation of the trade-off space implied by that uh, performance model uh, using a queuing theory. So this is a numeric model. And you see a very interesting set, uh, uh, set of patterns here. First, you do see a plateau. And that plateau is where a computer wants to live. But you also see very sharp nonlinear breakpoints. And those breakpoints suggest that if your balance within the machine is too far in one of several different dimensions, or your problem has demands which. You all heard that too, right? <laughs> okay, okay. Um, was that supposed to communicate something to me? <laughs> you just do that. It's, it's somewhere here. Where yeah, okay, to, to, the, to the speakers after me, you know, don't get freaked out <laughs> the way I did. Well, <laughs> I'm looking at a clock. I got more minutes, all right? I mean, the, the, the gentleman in the red jacket uh, who is sleeping through my talk it's actually only happened to me once before. Um, Okay, I didn't shake his hand during your, your, okay. All right, so we understand from this that to achieve the future of computing, we have to better associate 
the patterns of demand with the patterns of capability, and this within the constraints of the technologies that are emerging. And here's a, here's a typical pattern that you'll see. This is a, a, a code well used, an MPI code called Gadget. It's an in-body code, uh, typical Barnes Hut code actually, a million particles used here. And, and what you're seeing, as, uh, as you can imagine on the simulation time, are these epochs. And at the end of each epoch is a global barrier. This typical pattern for computing. The red is when we're processing and the blue is when we're not. The vertical axis, the ordinate, are different threads. This is uh, also referred to, excuse me, as BSP or bulk synchronous parallel, uh, uh, articulated by Leslie Valiant of Harvard uh, to explain a good discipline for writing code. And, and this is very, very popular. But if you notice the succession of staging of different epochs is always determined by the red thread that takes the longest period of time. And where there are irregularities and non-uniformities in the amount of time required by uh, the processing, uh, all that time is wasted. And by the way, all that energy is wasted. This is how, in many cases, we do computing today. In fact, if you were to use measurements of sustained versus peak performance, say measured in flops, you would find for real world problems that typical numbers are in the order of sig single digit percentages. Yes, benchmarks will give you 60, 70, 80, even up to 90% efficiency. Unless you do what Jack Dungara, who uh, was a key contributor, was perhaps the key contributor to LINPAC, has been doing over the last two years in the development of a new benchmark, HPCG or conjugate gradient, a much more honest benchmark that stresses the memory system as well as the uh, uh, floating point ALU system. And in recent numbers just published for, and I don't recall how many machines, I, I seem to feel something like a couple of dozen, but, but don't quote me on that, uh, comparing the efficiencies of HPCG to the already modulated efficiencies of LIMPAC, he was getting 1%, 2%, 3%, and the rare case of up to 4%. So we're finding that for a number of reasons, and as demonstrated quantitatively, we are wasting most of our computers in time, in floor space, in cost, and in energy. Why? Well, the reason is we're either programming our machines wrong or we're building the wrong machines for our programs. And each of the last five epochs, you will have seen a transition, as I already showed you, in the paradigm by which the computing is done. I don't like the term paradigm. It's pretentious. But I don't have a better word for it. I could say model, but everything's a model. Right? Go to the Maritime Museum here. Oh, by the way, I recommend it. Go to the Maritime Museum if you want to see models. Okay, they're models of ships, but they're really very interesting. Those were the computers of the day, by the way, because they didn't know, they didn't know how to do computational fluid dynamics. So they literally built the hull shapes and moved the water and watched how they behaved. But those are models. Right? A paradigm is when we really change the concept the abstraction by which we control and we govern computing and the development of the systems upon which we do the governing. We are past a point where, and this is an opinion, we're past a point where we need a new, a new model, a new paradigm, a new execution model, a new model of computation that allows us to coordinate the application work and the design. We refer to this, by the way, as co-design. Uh, it's become very popular. And in, in co-design in the small, where we reconfigure the machine to best, use, uh, to best address a certain workflow, this has been uh, quite uh, successful. I cite the work of Thomas Schultes in Switzerland at CSCS. Uh, this is related to uh, climate modeling. We need to improve dramatically the efficiency of our machines if we're only getting a few percent. We need to, however, dramatically improve scalability. If we're going to be able to apply a single machine 
a hundred times faster than those of today, me mega machines of today. Uh, we need to improve our scalability by orders of magnitude. Now, historically, in the last 20 plus years, we have followed the path set forth by John Gustafson when he, and I believe I can credit him with having coined the term strong and weak scaling, uh, when he showed that by applying weak scaling as opposed to strong scaling, that we could uh, get more and more work to do and therefore build uh, putatively larger scaled uh, systems. Now, I remember reading his first paper. I think he was at Shell at the time. I read it and I laughed. I thought this was a fraudulent approach. Well, John and I are good friends. And it wasn't a fraudulent approach. In fact, Horst Simon, uh, a few years ago, actually 10 years ago, thinking about what the top 10 ideas of the previous 20 years, cited uh, this work by John and his colleagues on weak scaling as the number one idea of the period in computing. And I agree with that uh, fully. Doesn't mean it's the path to the future. We need to devise new computer architectures that can respond to the new challenges that we're facing. And this requires research. It requires uh, research ideas and research platforms. And I'll briefly show you one such idea. An execution model, in fact, is a cross-cutting idea that isn't a single layer, a single abstraction, but rather cross-cuts from programming models through uh, programming languages and compilers through runtime systems, which I'll discuss in more detail, and operating systems, and then down to the system and core level architectures. It's how to talk about the total system holistically within a single vernacular, a single lexicon. So it's very, very important. Here's a, here's a diagram, a cartoon, of a new approach. I already showed you a diagram of the BSP approach. Here is a, here's an approach, and there are four different elements, which I'll talk about uh, individually for a moment. It's a little dry. There's no way to make this incredibly exciting unless you, unless you really try to get into my head here. The uh, squiggly lines, uh, you can think of them in terms of threads. We don't, but like threads, they represent the computation that is occurring uh, within a unit of work uh, that is relatively local. All the operations are relatively local. And they work largely but not exclusively on, on local data. Uh, we refer to these as complexes. And the reason we do is because the thread suggests a sequential flow of instructions, not, um, uh, and, and we in fact handle within such a unit uh, data flow. Uh, synchronization. The uh, arcs that you see with the arrows at one end, they represent not message passing, but message driven computation. Not a new idea. This is an idea that goes back decades in one form or another. Uh, the, the data flow computing of the uh, uh, 70s and uh, early 80s is, is simply one of a number of approaches. The work by uh, Berkeley uh, over a decade ago that they referred to as active messages is another example, but there are many, many others. We call ours parcels. They not only move the work to the data instead of always assuming the data to the work, but they also move uh, the control physically. And this ability to migrate continuations is a uh, special capability, very different from conventional processing. These green boxes are a form of synchronization, also not new, but integrated and synthesized into the model differently. And this is, in fact, um, uh, uh, set of, we call them local control objects. They're, they are futures and data flow constructs and a number of other rich semantics for control. And finally, there, the, all of this is embedded in abstraction of a global address space. Some of you may be familiar with the notion of PGAS or partition global address space. I was one of the co-authors on a book about UPC, uh, a language that a friend of mine, Bill Carlson, wrote, which was the PGAS language. Unfortunately, uh, PGAS, which, which is clever, nonetheless doesn't provide you with all the capabilities. Now, I uh, provided these slides so that they be in the slide set so you look at them, but I've already spoken to uh, these issues. And... The notion of the parallax execution model has been represented 
partially experimentally and part, partly for real uh, world computation as a runtime system to run on uh, conventional machines. There are other runtime systems that are being experimented with in Europe, in Japan, uh, and also in the US. I mentioned a few of these. Indeed, for the HPX runtime system, uh, there are at least two completely separate code stacks, the other one being developed or having been developed at uh, Louisiana State University and focusing on such things as uh, C++ and uh, Boost libraries. Our focus is on performance. This is a diagram that simply represents the structure, the software structure of HPX and the support for each of uh, those um, different uh, uh, functional characteristics I've just described. I've already discussed briefly what the distinguishing features are. While there are many runtime systems in a broad class referred to as asynchronous multiple task uh, computation, the HPX uh, runtime system provides uh, these uh, special characteristics, uh, in particular uh, global address spaces and as first class objects, both those threads that I showed you and processes that serve as context are also first class objects. And those processes span multiple nodes as an abstraction, not a single node. Very important for performance portability. Now I'm told, am I told that this works? Well, I don't see. There we go. Okay, let's see. Here's an example of a shortwave gamma ray burst uh, computation performed by HPX to demonstrate, uh, to study uh, the behavior of a certain cosmological events. Uh, and this, in fact, for this particular problem, is a first ever. You'll notice that there's a double reflection here, and this what appears to be circular. Uh, property was not coded into the application, but it is an emergent behavior of the underlying physics. And this was all done dynamically using adaptive mesh refinement, which allows you to do on the order of 10,000 more operations uh, in unit time than you would expect using conventional fixed grid uh, processing. It's also multi-physics. This curve, which is a little hard to explain, but uh, I will simply point out that in physical time, which is the uh, uh, abscissa, here, if you in your mind draw a vertical line, the simulation time, you'll notice it hits different lines, different parts of the simulation time are being performed simultaneously. I wish I could, I could convey to you the elegance of this particular uh, slide because it shows that instead of having these episodic barriers synchronization of BSP, you can now overlap different epochs of computation reducing the time to solution and increasing the apparent parallelism. Knight's Landing is a future generation version of the Xeon Phi. And when it is released, sometime within, I trust, the next year by Intel, it will be the first case of uh, Mike to be able to be center into the memory bus. And these lightweight cores will be an important step forward in reducing energy and increasing the parallelism. The plans are already gone forward uh, to develop the next year, the generation of machines. And this is the era of the 100 petaflops machines. One and only one such program uh, in the US is called Coral, and it'll implement three machines in excess of 100 petaflops over the remaining parts of this decade. And the machine at uh, Oak Ridge, where Titan now sits, will also be a GPU-based machine. But the machine in Argonne will be a Xeon Phi-based machine. And so we see that there is a continuing question as to what those architectures should, um, should take. Other approaches to uh, future generation high-performance computing include the use of specialized hardware, a special purpose machine. One such is done at D.E. Shaw in New York City. My colleague John Salmon is there, in which by building special purpose devices, they've been able to accelerate uh, to an extraordinary degree. Actually, they think ultimately the uh, problem of molecular dynamics and using the Anton. Anton 3 is, is now beginning to be designed as well. And of course, molecular dynamics means custom design of drugs. And this has tremendous or could have tremendous impact. So I, I want to conclude by uh, looking forward, by looking backwards. There are a few of you who seem to be roughly my generation, surprisingly few of you. Uh, and in the 50s was the first time that I encountered the term quantum mechanic. 
Now, in the movie Forbidden Planet, and if you haven't seen it, I, I would strongly suggest that you do so, in um, uh, Quantum Mechanic, uh, the quantum mechanic referred to uh, a class of uh, engines that were, were quantum-driven engines. And here we were introduced to Robbie the robot and, um, and uh, some uh, uh, other concepts. It didn't occur to me that quantum would become a word that I would use uh, more uh, professionally. I'm standing in front of a D-Wave computer in... in uh, uh, Marina del Rey in, in California, uh, next to Los Angeles, you'll notice that I'm being cautious and I'm standing outside of this box, not inside the box, uh, because there are, certain uns there are real uncertainties about being inside a, a quantum computer, I would believe. Uh, there is this notion of Schrodinger's cat. This is not Schrodinger's cat. It's very clear in the look and the expression of this cat that it, uh, it has its own views on this, uh, on this problem. Quantum computing is really at the cutting edge, at the form edge. And in a statement made by Google only in the last uh, small number of days, even they, and they have invested significantly in quantum computing, have re recognized that it's a decades-long process. In the end, that giant box holds a single chip. That chip is cooled down to about 30 millikelvin, millikelvins, I beg your pardon. You know, I, I used to work um, on, um, on superconducting supercomputing, and, and that, ran, um, that ran at a balmy four kelvin, so four degrees above absolute zero. And I was told nobody will ever do that because uh, you don't have a spigot with liquid helium. Uh, coming out of it. It was just impractical. Now, they go down, you know, a thousand times lower and nobody seems to mind at all, which is a little uh, unnerving. Quantum computing is as yet unproven, but there, are, at least for certain classes of algorithms, are, uh, are, are very exciting. There are problems that theoretically could be performed by quantum computers that could never in the lifetime of the universe be performed by practical machines. So, one possibility of a future generation machine is this. So, finally, I'd like to close by introducing, telling you about the fastest, highest performing computer that um, you've probably never heard of. Mongo Mongoose 5, please Google it. Uh, it is, um, you'll be surprised by the technology. Uh, it has been in operation for some years. It has properties and structures very similar to what you might anticipate, but maybe not exactly the properties or parameters. It's based on the MIPS R3000. That's a fairly old architecture. Its clock rate is 12 megahertz. And while I.O. is always bad in a supercomputer, this is literally atrocious. It's 1,000 bits per second. Good news, it's radiation hardened. So for those of you who visit Los Alamos National Labs, you know, it can work up there at 10,000 feet or 3,000 meters, as the case may be. Um, I don't even know the manufacturer. And it is a parallel machine. It has two cores, and each of those cores has a backup core. So it is a parallel computer. You may be wondering why this is the fastest, highest performing computer. Why would I make such a claim when my very professional integrity is on the line? It's because of the packaging. Think of this as the rack. I introduce to you New Horizon, a spacecraft. And the reason it is the fastest machine is because it exceeded 56,000 miles per hour. And the reason it's the highest performing machine is because it's an altitude of 3.5 million miles. I'm sorry, billion miles. All right. Obviously, I'm being disingenuous. I was very excited a couple of weeks ago when after over nine years of travel through space, New Horizons, uh, nine years, okay, spent several hours flying past the um, Pluto system, uh, one dwarf planet and five moons. And I just wanted to have an excuse to show what I think is one of the most astounding 
photographs in my lifetime. So of course I did what you would all do, I googled Pluto uh, to get that picture and this is what I got. <laughs> so those of you working on big data, you still got some work to do. Um, this is not what I wanted. This is what I wanted. And uh, in, that, that, isn't this pretty, but this is unbelievable. This is extraordinary. When I was a young, a young man, we didn't even know Pluto had a moon. Of course, that's when Pluto was a planet, too. And I started by saying I was born in 1949 and supercomputing was in, started in 1949. But there's a third field that started in 49 as well. And that was humans' exploration of space. Because it was in 1949 that the bumper rocket, and honestly, I don't know whether it was from White Sands, uh, proving ground, I think it was, in New Mexico, um, which was a composite of two rockets that are previously developed, again during war, the um, A-4 rocket, the big one on the bottom, and the WAC Corporal on the top. You'll know the A-4 more, unfortunately labeled the V-2, used uh, uh, during the war. But as a result of that, that WAC Corporal went to an altitude of 244 miles into space, which, by the way, is the same altitude as the International Space Station. So in conclusion, we are now facing the end of Moore's Law. Some feel Moore's Law, and by the original numbers, Moore's Law is already dead. To get past that, new execution models will offer dramatic improvements in efficiency and scalability that will get us to exascale, but require that we do things different. One of those different things is the use of runtime system software for uh, providing a dynamic and adaptive computation and management of concurrency. Ultimately, we will enter a neo-digital age, a post-von Neumann age, where a new class of organizations and structures using the then end of Moore's Law technology will yield us another set of quantum leaps. And who knows, maybe finally quantum computing itself may give us yet more capability. Thank you all very much. Thank you.